Welcome to Faith Family, United Church of Christ Bible Study. We are going through a series called Bible Study 101, Basic Bibles, uh, base, the Basic Bible. And what we've done over the last years, we've went through each and every book of the Bible. Um, we're now up to Hebrews, the, book, uh, the letter to the Hebrews uh, in the New Testament. Um, we've only got a couple more weeks to go. Next week, we were going to do James, the letter to James and uh, first and second Peter. Um, so we only have a few more. We're gonna finish it up before this year's out, um, take a little uh, vacation for Christmas, and then we'll start back up next year. Um, so let's go ahead and get started. We're in uh, uh, Hebrews, like I said, and- uh, Page 1044. 1044 in your uh, pew Bibles. Okay. This is, just so you all know, the, the pew Bibles, is the uh, RS, uh, the new Revised Standard, or no, I'm sorry, it's the older Revised Standard. It's a Revised Standard Edition. Now there's a new Revised Standard Translation, which they go in there and they try to change the words to be more inclusive. Now that was been out for a long time, new Revised Standard. There's actually a new, new Revised Standard out now, which uh, goes even further. Um, and it, it's little things that the, the scholars learn and they say, you know, we could probably change that a little bit, you know, and they, they, they look at everything like the culture, uh, the words like my, my favorite one is, is bad. You know, you say, well, is that, is that in vogue now? You know, oh, he's one bad guy or, or she's, oh, that outfit is bad. That's like. Well, we don't, the, the vernacular has changed. The young people don't talk like that anymore. It's, it's look at your drip. <laughs> it means, means look at your style. Uh, but, but you see things like that, go come and go in, in fashion, and words don't mean the same 50 years apart. And so they go back and they look at that and they try to determine um, when they find things of that era, that time period, and they say, oh, that's kind of a euphemism or something like that. So they change the translation just a little bit. Give us, and, and, and they try to make it more relevant to our times as well. So, so they're doing a great job. And as long as they get the main meaning. And the main meaning is it's about love. It's a love story <laughs> between God and God's people. <laughs> so anyway, let's start with Hebrews. Um, you said 1044. Um, author, date, and recipients. Okay, the author, or excuse me, let's go with the date first. It's uh, written about between 60 and 90 um, AD. Okay, so, so about 30 years to, to 60 years after Christ is gone. Um, in, the, in the beginning, the church had a tradition of, let me, let me say something about the date first. Um, the dates aren't important, but it's, it's, it's nice to see how the Bible comes together and how some books were written before other books, but then why are they, you know, before this book, when this book was written before that book? And, and it's, it's, it's about continuity, uh, length of the Bible. So um, one of the reasons that it's, it's such a large um, date is because some scholars want to say that if you read it, there isn't really uh, a um, any kind of mention of the temple fall or Jerusalem fall. So Jerusalem fell to the Romans. They had an uprising. Roman troops went in there, wiped everybody out, kicked out the Jews, tore down the temple, and that happened in 70 AD. So you can see some scholars want to put it before that, before 70, so they go back to 60 and say there's no mention of the temple being destroyed or the, what's called the diaspora. That's where the Jews were scattered because they had to leave Jerusalem. They, there was so much persecution um, by the Romans and the Roman soldiers. So they give it a really early date. Others say it's an older, it's an older version because some of the, the, um, the um, theology that it talks about some of the doctrines that it's, it's, it's trying to um, have people understand. 
So it's, it looks like it's a more defined and thought out um, uh, doctrine. So they give it a later date. Um, so that's why you have such a big date there. Um, the author. Okay, the author, in the beginning, the church tradition said that Paul wrote this book. That's why it's right after all the Paul writings. So that gives Paul 14 books um, by tradition. Uh, Clement of Rome and uh, Origen, these are two early church leaders, okay? Uh, their dates are 150 and 180, so right at the, the, the turn of the century, going from the first century to the second century, or even later in the middle, they question that. They still affirm church traditions as Paul wrote them, but they had questions. So uh, the authorship, they attribute it to him through tradition. That was very important at that time. We had this tradition and uh, so they, but they had questions about it. Um, several synods, church councils, uh, affirmed that Paul was the author, author, author until uh, 4th century. So that's in the, in the middle to late 300s. And that's when these synods were really at their height. But they affirmed that Paul is the author. Um, during the Reformation, other authors were like other authors were suggested. Now this is the time of, of Zwingli, uh, Luther, uh, Calvin, and uh, the the new formed uh, uh, Church of England. <laughs> so these people said, mm, you know, we don't think it's Paul. It just doesn't sound like Paul. And uh, and uh, so, so some of the other suggestions they had, uh, Thomas Aquinas. Thomas Aquinas was an early, he, was, he would have been in one of those early synods. Um, he uh, wrote an apology uh, trying to explain Christianity to the pagan religions. Um, so he said, suggested uh, Luke was, see, still have that connection to Paul. So he claims that Luke wrote it. And uh, Calvin also, um, John Calvin um, said that Luke uh, another one that, that, that Calvin suggested was Clement of Rome. But we have uh, in, a, in a, a letter called First Clement uh, where he writes um, that, and some of his writings actually quote directly from Hebrews. So that's probably not likely. Um, there, there's kind of a, 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 a humility thing going on where you don't quote your own your own stuff. So Clement, eh, probably not. Uh, Barnabas. Barnabas was one was Paul when Paul became a Christian, and uh, they left Antioch. He took Paul and Barnabas were together, and they were going on missionary trips to to the east um, to you know uh, convert uh, uh, Gentiles. Uh, they were sent to the Gentiles to convert them to Christianity. And they were together. And Tertullian um, suggests this. Um, so that could be one, that could, that could be. But uh, most scholars say probably not. And um, uh, Martin Luther suggested that Apollos, and that was one another, that's another one of Paul's um, co-workers in the spreading the, spreading the, the gospel. Um, and you'll find him in, in Acts, in the book of Acts. Um, but you have all these possibilities of who wrote it. And now it's believed that it isn't Paul, but there's no conclusive evidence of who it is. And if you, if you look at the very first part of Hebrews, uh, it says, In many and various ways God spoke of old to our fathers and the prophets, But in those days, wait a minute. Let's let's just turn back one one book. Let's go to the book of Philemon. Or Philemon. Philemon. She said she pronounces Philemon. Philemon. I heard. I learned it. Philemon. Okay, we'll go with that. We'll go with that. <laughs> but 
But look at look at Philemon, just just one book back, um, and it starts out. How's it start out? Paul. I Paul. I Paul. Right. A prisoner. Okay. So go to go to Titus. Go back one more book. What's it say? Paul. Paul. Servant of God. So when you go back and you look at all of Paul's letters or people that claim that Paul wrote them, it's because That's Paul put his beginning. name right there at the beginning of it. Uh -huh. This one doesn't. Okay. So so my favorite, my favorite quote, and who I agree with, is Origen. Origen says, in the words, in the words of Origen, but who wrote the epistle in truth? God knows. <laughs> in other words, the rest of us don't. we don't know. We don't know where this came from. But it's it's good. It's written in the spirit. And so that's that, that's it's inspired by God, it's inspired by God's truth. God's love, and so it should be part of our. So that that's I thought that was interesting. Um, so the author, you go by early church tradition, you say Paul wrote it. Um, today, some some church leader wrote it, and the book itself is, is geared towards Jewish people that have become Christians. Okay. So, so we'll get to that a little bit later. So it's got to be someone that actually understands the Jewish law and tradition. So it was probably some kind of like a rabbi or some kind of uh, a teacher of the law that had been converted. And now he's explaining it to the Jewish people that have been converted, saying, guess what? You don't have to go back and follow the law to be a Christian. And so, and then, and then he kind of walks them through it. Okay, so. The recipients of the Jewish converged to Christianity. Now, you think about that. Think of all that the Jews have been through. Okay, you look at their Old Testament, right? The first thing they went through was their captivity in Egypt, and they got out of that. Then God gave them the land of, you know, uh, the, the Israel now. And uh, they went up there, and they were settled. They had to make room for every they had to push people out. Okay, so they had to battle. And that was a lot of lot of hardship there. And then, what happens? Well, first of all, half of them get carried away during the Babylonian captivity, or the Assyrian captivity, and then the second half get carried away to the Babylonian captivity. And they're pulled out of there again. They're captive in Babylon. Um, in Assyria, and then they finally come back. So you can see there's a lot of heritage there, and it, you know, it's like it's like we, we you know, we're Americans. We, you know, America's the greatest country in the world. So you got that heritage, but it's um, alongside their their religion as well. Their religion and their heritage are, are very close. And so what you had was the Jewish heritage, and yet they wanted to progress. An understanding of God into this new covenant of Christianity. And so that's that's who is the recipients of this letter. Um, there is no specific church mentioned. Um, however, uh, it might have been, like we said with Timothy and Titus, uh, a circular letter, meant to be a circulator. Right? So the congregations that have a lot of Jews in them, here, read this to them. So that's who the recipients, the purpose. Okay, the purpose of the letter is to address Jewish converts in progressing from Judaism to Christianity. Now that's hard because Judaism, it's a religion, but it's a culture. It's a heritage. Okay, so people want to hold on to that. So how do you hold on to that, but yet progress into this new covenant? And uh, that's, that's, the, that's the purpose of this book, is to allow these people to understand that you have, you have your Judaism, you hold on to who you are as a nation, but we need to progress into an understanding of who God is. Okay. 
and that, and that is through the Christ. Uh, there may have been some Judaizers. Now, this is a word that you see sometimes. Judaizers were people that would that would choose that would come into a Christian and try to make you become uh, a Jew first. So they would come in and they say they would say, okay, if you want to be a, a, a Christian, you have to first because Christ was a Jew. So you have to you have to embrace that first. You have to become a Jew Jewish convert first. And we see that also in Acts, where Paul takes Timothy, who's uh, part Jew, part um, uh, Gentile, and brings him. He has the ceremony where he becomes a Jew. So there's there, there's these Judaizers who try to the Judaizers who try to um, who try to make people come Jews first. And what happens when you become a Jew? Well, now you have to follow the law and, and the prophets. And, and, and so, and that's the strict restrictions. So, so you, you don't go, you don't become uh, free in Christ. You become bound back under the law. And so this is to, to kind of fight their teachings and them going around and trying to change um, what's happened. Yeah. And they said, you know, like I said, to be, uh, Judaism, you have to uh, keep the law of Judaism, the laws of Judaism, um, to be a true Christian. So you have to, you know, you can't just become a Christian, you have to go back. And so, uh, and this is another thing. If you noticed, it didn't start out with a salutation, it started right into what he wanted to say, right? And so, they kind of think, so kind of, this isn't a true uh, letter to someone as, more, as much as it is, a, it might be a sermon, you know. Now, at the end, we have the, like the, the salutations and goodbye and exhortations that you, that you have in a letter. But at the beginning, you don't have that. And, and there's right before you have the salutation, you have an amen. So let it be so, you know what I just said and I you know how I am that I like to end my sermons with amen you know because hopefully that you thought about this and you agree and hey let's do this and that's what it means let this happen um, so you see that you'll see that at the end of of, uh, of Hebrews um, so um, and, and it's like I say it's a, it's a sermon showing how the Jewish tradition led to Christianity in other words this happened, and he's talking to these Jews. This happened in our history, and that was a that was all leading up to this Christ coming. And this Christ coming is a new covenant, like the one of Abraham, like the one of um, Moses, and and the new covenant when we return to from our captivity in Babylon and Assyria. And so, uh, this is all leading to Christianity. Yes. Do the Jews have to give up a lot to become Christian? Oh yeah, you you would have been ostracized. Family. I mean, you think about it. If you you come from a Jewish family, and you you're this new teaching, mm -hmm. and you're going out, no, 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 this is a false, this isn't the Christ, you know. And so the most of the Jews now say that Christ wasn't real. Um, he wasn't. He wasn't God. He wasn't the Son of God. It okay. was just he might have been just a man that had different teachings. Okay. But yeah, it would be like like telling your family, you know, oh, I'm uh, a Christian family. Say so you're, you're you're Catholic, and and you say, you know, I'm going to become a Protestant, and you got a deep Catholic roots. <laughs> what? Or you're going to become Muslim. Really? Or or Muslim, you know. Oh yeah. So you can see that would that. Would, that would not go well on, on Thanksgiving dinners. <laughs> no. So yes, they did give up a lot for that. Um, and and, and the, the Jewish, it's a, it's, a, it's, it's a culture, it's a community. You know, they took care of each other. And they had to because it was they, you know, them against the world. And uh, so you, you're giving up the things that your community usually helps you do. And that's why a lot of the early churches in Christianity, early churches, they 
took that and they became a community of themselves and they took care of themselves. They become you, your new family, you know? So we know what that's like, right? Family, family of origin, family of choice. So, okay, so that's the purpose. And the theme is kind of a Jewish history lesson or sermon uh, along with how Judaism became its logical conclusion. That's important because this is like he's arguing logic here. You know, here's, here's what we went through. And the logical conclusion is Christ and this new covenant called Christianity. So that's the theme. So let's look at, I just want to go through this. It's, it's 13 chapters. Um, I just want to go through and hit the highlights of each theme. Um, so this is broken down into maybe paragraphs or a little bit more than paragraphs, maybe a whole chapters. Okay, so we, we start out with this idea that Christ or God's son is greater than angels because angels are heavenly beings. They're in the presence of God, but Christ is above them. So that's 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 important. That's what we start out with. How important Christ is. Okay, and then from there we go to this warning to pay attention to what all of the Old Testament has said, and uh, <coughs> that's important. And that's that's pretty much takes up chapter one and chapter two, um, because the prophets. They're talking to us. They're telling us what we need to do. Social justice, uh, stop oppression, be kind to the stranger, take care of the sick. You know, all those things um, that we think of today that are charity. But it's right there and it's told to you. Pay attention to it, you know? And so that's chapter two, chapter three. And then Jesus was made uh, subject to humanity. In other words, he became a human being. He was in the realm with the angels and, and God and came to earth and he became a human. Lower than the angels. Say that. And uh, he became our brother. Uh, our brother as God's children. Okay. And then talks about how Jesus is greater than Moses. Now, you want to go, go to go to any kind of Jewish gathering and try to use that sentence right there. Jesus was greater than Moses and see what happens. <laughs> yeah, that, that talk about killing Thanksgiving dinner. That would do that. <laughs> um, but that's what he talks about. He talks about how Christ is. And then he talks about how listen to the Old Testament because it's there. It's calling for the Christ. And then Jesus is made subject, even though he was above everything, he's a human being. And then Jesus, who is the Christ, is greater than Moses. Why? He goes on to tell that. He talks about a new covenant. And then how the Sabbath uh, is a rest for God and God's people. So there's a rest period there. So, and, and that's what he's that's what he's pointing to. He's pointing to the fact that there's no scripture from after returning from Babylon to this no scripture that God has been talking to the people. The prophets have us about this. Now are they talking about the Sabbath being Saturday or Sunday? Well that their their Sabbath would have been Saturday. Right. And you gotta remember mm -hmm. the Jewish calendar goes one, it's a moon calendar. Oh. Two, it starts in the evening. Because in the New Testament it says there was evening and there was morning the first day. Okay. So when the sun goes down, it's the next day. That's why here at 7 o'clock, the sun's down. That's when they have their Sabbath on Friday. No, it's not Friday. It's Saturday now because the sun went down. So it's the next day. And, and then, then Saturday is the day of rest from sundown Friday night until sundown Saturday night. That's the Sabbath. Okay? So, uh, but he's talking about this idea of Sabbath being bigger. I mean, after God had six days of, 
of creation, he rested. And he's closer to still resting, but he's not. But God is still ruling. Okay, so, so he's talking about the rest for the people as well, how important that is. Um, and what are we at? Um, greater than Moses, rest on the Sabbath. Um, Jesus is the great high priest. Is that what I've got next? High priest. In the order of Melchizedek. This is interesting. Because at the time of Jesus, and in the time of the first century when this was written, or late, late first century, there was this idea of Melchizedek. Who is Melchizedek? And you get Melchizedek two times in the Old Testament. He is the king of Salem. We read that in, in, uh, in Genesis when uh, Abraham goes out with other kings and they basically they go back and they get his nephew Lot back because they went into Sodom and they took the, took the city and they carried off all the people to slavery. And so Moses, or, uh, Abraham and some of the kings went and got them back. And uh, Melchizedek, who was one of them, was the king of Salem, which they, they believe is Jerusalem now. Um, and uh, he was also known as the high priest of God. Nowhere do we talk about this in the, in the Old Testament. All we hear is that uh, they, Abraham went to Melchizedek and gave him a tenth. That's where we get our tithe, tenth, mm -hmm. um, uh, to him as a priest. And then later on, we're going to see in the, in the priests get a tenth, the priests of the sons of Aaron, the Levites. Uh, they get a tenth of everybody's earnings. And that's kind of the, the story behind why they do that. But uh, the, the other time is in a psalm that we read about Melchizedek. And it's like, who is Melchizedek? What is this about? And so there's a lot of speculation going on about who Melchizedek is. And the only thing we know, king of, uh, of Salem and the high priest of God. And see, this is what I'm going to I'm, I'm Remind me to ask you after class, and, and I'll tell you a little bit how I believe it. This, this, this pulls in the idea that we can accept other religions. That's what I believe. Anyway, so that's Melchizedek, and then we go to the next thing is the warning of falling away. In other words, don't use your newly found Christianity to stop searching for God, to stop looking for God and trying to do God's will here on earth. Um, and then God's true promises. And then we get to chapter 7. And chapter 7, guess what it's about? Melchizedek. It talks about who Melchizedek was as the high priest. And then it says that Jesus is the new high priest like Melchizedek. In other words, it didn't come through Aaron's sons like the, the traditional uh, um, priests that would do the sacrifices and all that. This is a, this is a different order of high priest, and it's Melchizedek. And Jesus is like Melchizedek. Okay? And then Jesus is the high priest of the new covenant. Remember, we've already said that he was, the, um, he was uh, greater than Moses. Moses was the old covenant. This is now the new covenant. Or as we say it today, the New Testament. Okay, so that's what the Testament and covenant synonymous. Okay, so um, Christ's sacrifice is once and for all. That's the next uh, area. And basically he's talking about the, 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 all the sacrifice day after day and how this sacrifice uh, isn't a true sacrifice for this for that okay so it'll take away your sins if you sacrifice this no it just that stays Christ's sacrifice was once and for all boom because it was done out of love okay so by faith by faith this is chapter um, 11 huh? 
This is my favorite chapter. And it goes through the Old Testament. Remember, we're talking to Jews. We're, we're, we're writing to Jews that became Christians. And it talks about by faith. And it goes through there. And it just hits the big, the big names, you know. Abel gave a, more, a better offering than Cain because he did it out of faith. Uh, uh, Enoch. Enoch never saw death because God took him away because of his faith. Abraham, he was credited as righteous because of his faith. And so it goes through all the lists of uh, all the big names in the Old Testament and how faithful they were. And then they, they did, they lived by faith. Okay, so, yeah, that's one of my favorites. If you could ever read, read that one, read that one. Okay, and then God's di discipline, God's people. In other words, if you do something wrong, um, you know, I, I love Will Ferrell. It's like, he sings a little song. How's it go? Here comes the consequence, consequence, consequence for my actions. Consequences for your actions. And he sings this little song. Like, Here comes the consequence, consequence. <laughs> What's that? You never heard that? Yeah, but I don't think Will Ferrell. Okay, anyway. And, and that's basically what he's saying. God, God's punishment is really the consequences for your own action. You know, don't do this. And you did it. Now you have to pay the consequence. And a lot of times the consequence is going to be something that looks like God's punishing you. And, and, it's, and, and it's just like your children. You know, when you, when you go to correct your children. I was one of those parents that my kids grow up. It's like, uh-oh, they shouldn't do that. But... It isn't going to hurt them or maim them. It, it probably will hurt, but it won't, you know, kill them or <laughs> lose a digit. So, oh, you shouldn't have done that, right? <laughs> you know, let them do it. Let them learn it the hard way. Because if I say, don't do that, if they don't come back with why, they're going to do it as soon as you turn your back. Right? And that's kind of like this idea, this idea that God says, don't do it. You did it anyway. Mm, okay. See, I told you. Shouldn't have done it. Um, then there's another warning against refusing God. Okay. And this is kind of a warning that, that's telling them, hey, Christ is the new covenant. This is the new way. This is what we need to move into. Kind of, kind of like what we're doing. Christianity has gone and lost its way. Uh, we're trying to show you a different way, the way the world is going, and we need to change our ways, not to conform to the world, but to teach the world um, what God is really like, and that's love, compassion, caring for each other, forgiveness, those things. And, uh, but refusing to move along that path, can you see how that kind of fits into what our area and what we're doing? And then the conclusion is an exhortation to continue on and be strong. And that's where we also get that, that little ending uh, in chapter 13, which uh, after he says, amen, brothers, I urge you to bear with uh, my word of exhortation, for I have written to you in a short letter. I want you to know that our brother Timothy will be released. Timothy uh, is in prison and he's being released. And he hopes to come to them. See, kind of a, a letter ending there. So uh, that's that's basically what we got. So um, any questions about Hebrews? And, and this is this is a great book because it allows us to bridge that gap between the Old Testament and the New Testament. But at the same time, we don't have to go. We have to deeply study the Old Testament. This hits pretty much the good highlights of the Old Testament for us Gentiles that are Christians. So we understand where it came from and how it flowed into today's church. So order of, order of Melchizedek. Yes. Is it more like I order you to be a high priest or the order is you got to go blah, 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 check off all these boxes? Yeah, that was the thing. There was so much speculation on Melchizedek because there's only two verses in the Old Testament that has his name in it. And it's like, who is Melchizedek? And he's supposed to be a high priest? How is this so? You know, 
And so a lot of the, the, the teachers of the law and the, and the, and the um, uh, uh, rabbis of the first century, they were coming up with these ideas of who Melchizedek was. And it's, it's, like, it's like Jethro. Who is Jethro? Jethro is Moses' father-in-law. He was also a, a, a priest. And it's like, well, wait a minute. All the priests are in Egypt <laughs> with, with uh, you know, and they didn't really have a priesthood at that time. So this idea that there's priests or there's religion outside of what we have here in the Bible. That's what I was talking about, how we can accept other religions because these are people also seeking to understand God. They're on a different path than we are. And so that's, that's this Melchizedek, that's Jethro, and uh, the, the priest of Midian, he's called. So you see, you see there's, there's, there's that, where the Bible just kind of talks about, hey, there's some people over here that are priests of God, there are people over here that are priests of God, but we're talking about the Jewish people because that's where the Christ is going to come. Thank you. Next week we're going to do um, what I said, James and First and Second Peter. Those are two really short letters. All three really short letters. So do that next week.